continuing in chapter 41 as we mentioned chapter 41 is a very uh, fundamental chapter about the concept of love the concept of fear slash awe slash respect uh, in divine service and ultimately in all human relationships as uh, we explained at great length yesterday and we'll continue with this idea today so um I, I think it was yesterday um um i forget who it was now that asked it asked a question yesterday what happens you don't you, you just you know we we do good we do mitzvahs um but we don't feel necessarily we don't feel anything and what what do we do you, you pray you don't really feel anything you um study torah like now or maybe even when you're doing something charitable you, you just don't feel you don't experience any uh anything deeply emotionally maybe not even intellectually perhaps um and um should you do it so, you know we live in a in, in a western culture that you know if you don't feel it well you ain't feeling it then it ain't real and therefore don't bother i don't think that's a different take on that um and that first of all the basis of doing a mitzvah is a connection in itself the mechanical act is a connection and it brings uh, a divine a divinity into the world ah you don't experience it okay and even if you try to you know to get some kind of feeling some kind of sense of connectivity and it just doesn't happen so the other uh, addresses that today uh we we addressed it a bit yesterday but today it's in, in greater length and um he says person let's say you 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 you're mindful right now we're studying torah and as we explained yesterday there's an awesome connection that we're having with god right now in our study um and um you might even have meditated upon it and maybe it didn't move you so what does that say does that say that you're like either you either it's not worth it or does it say that it's um like i'm just you know i'm not up to grade is that a statement about me um furthermore let, let's say a person as we explained to you, uh, in previous classes you know you, you even think about the presence of god and you think in a real way that you know he's even he sees me and and then uh, that doesn't move me it doesn't move me emotionally it doesn't even move me um so to speak intellectually so the other thing explains like this um he says why would that be so if it's an earnest and an honest person who's really making an effort right uh, obviously if someone's in a relationship not making an effort um we're not talking about that I mean, that that's a whole you know different kettle of fish <laughs> that's a whole different issue if you're not honest and you're not earnest about your effort right in a human relationship and of course in a relationship with god then um then we're not talking about that but how could it be that someone is earnest and honest and, and you just don't aren't moved by by this truth of god's presence of god's realness and have a feeling so the alternative explains that can be very well and it is in fact on account of the limited grade of the soul where it originates as we've explained the soul originates in four different worlds the loftiest souls in the world of Atsilus, that they are super lofty and their capability in um and sensitivity to the divine to something that's godly something that's really good 
is um is, is just very palpable for them then those of the world of bria it's not as but still very much so but then there in the world of Yitzhir, and then there's finally the world of asiya the world of action is the lowest of the spiritual worlds where souls come from and in that world itself there's 10 divine attributes you can come from a lower level of the divine attributes and therefore your your soul it, and and if I, we've explained previously this is not a condemnation of the soul this ends up being of what the place of the soul is what the function of the soul is you know the world of uh, uh Asilus is you know the the um the visionary the holy one the world of bria is the intellectually motivated the world of bria is the emotionally motivated and the world of asiya is the doers the foot soldiers who may not have the you know real feelings they don't they're foot soldiers follow the orders and do what they got to do and in the end they're the ones who you know uh break through and and make you know win the battle so to speak right so it's not a condemnation on this level of the soul it ends up being what is the function of that soul but yet being that it is a lower grade of the soul so they're going to be much more uh um callous to something that's divine they're going to be less sensitive to experiencing something godly feeling it and even intellectual you know feelings because in intellect there is feelings because that's feelings are the the mothers that produce the children called feelings from a in a, in, a, in the healthy way um so there is even in our intellect there is the the feeling you know the intellectual love the intellectual fear of god and that's missing the al says being that that's where the soul comes from and there was an earnest honest attempt to get connected to have a feeling to have at least a, an intellectual love an intellectual fear nevertheless because there's an intent here to serve god in this manner then it's unequivocally he calls it avoid gamura a complete service that's not a perfect service perfect service would be of course heartfelt and or at least in the mind you know that there would be you'd be moved in your in your mind so it's you don't have that but it's a complete service and here firstly the the alternative makes a distinction and there's a difference between serving god and having fear of god serving god is as we just explained the fact that you have intent and you are mindful that through whatever this meditation you have of the presence of god or the uniqueness of this particular mitzvah of how that connects you to god that you are complete in that service that you, without the intellectual love and awe even though it might not be fear because they're two separate mitzvahs ultimately they are two separate mitzvahs that's how he first explains now the alternative says actually you know what the very fact that a person you know and, and here it comes into a new definition of fear uh, we've touched upon it in the past but here is where he brings it complete that actually having just being mindful having intent and even and though you're not moved by it emotionally you're not even moved by it by like wow awesome you know in your mind it's not but you know you you think it like right now that we're being bound up with with god and in the mitzvah that we're doing right now studying torah for example right so he says it's still the fear of god and why why is it the fear because at that moment at any rate the the fear of heaven is upon the person meaning 
at least it's like the fear of not God as a king, you know, infinite king that is there before you, but as a mortal person is in the room. What happens when a mortal person is in the room as opposed to you're there alone? When you're there alone, you know, you can put your feet on the table. You might, you know, uh, whatever, do certain things that you wouldn't do when there's just one other person in the room. So what did that do? That one other person in the room, in the room do? You refrain from something that was unseemingly in the eyes of others. That, oh, they're looking. That person's looking. And therefore, it's unseemingly. And you refrain because of that. That's called the fear of God. <laughs> if we're just mindful, we just think, God's right here now. And I am very upset at what someone did, and yet I don't feel it, right? I don't even intellectually uh, awed by that. But because of it, I bite my tongue and I don't say something that I shouldn't say, that's called the fear of God. Because you refrain from something. You behaved differently because you thought of God being present in that moment. A powerful idea. Now, the alternative brings a proof from this from the Talmud um, that this is termed fear, right? Just the simple, the simple idea that you refrain from something because you know that God doesn't want you to say that. He doesn't want you to do that. He doesn't want you to act that way. Where is that? Uh, Rabbi Yechem bin Zakkai, who was the leader of the Jewish people in Jerusalem during the destruction of the Second Holy Temple in the year 69. So on his deathbed, this is after the destruction, many years, he uh, said to his students, you know, he gave them like sort of a, a goodbye uh, <laughs> blessing. And what was the goodbye blessing? He says to them that, um, may it be that God's will May the, the fear of heaven be upon you like the fear of a human being. And his students were kind of aghast. That's it? You know, that's all you expect from us? He said, hey, that's, that's quite an accomplishment. Don't put, don't put that down. Because a person, when they uh, want to commit a sin, what do they say to themselves? I hope no one sees me. Right? When you do something wrong, you say to yourself, I hope no one sees me. So Rabbi Yechanan says, I want to ensure that you're going to refrain from doing anything wrong, so at least you should have the image of another person in the room, and if that itself will help you to refrain from doing something wrong, well, that's called fear of God. Now, it doesn't mean, you know, it means if you're doing it because of the other person, so that's not the fear of God. I mean, that will refrain you from doing something wrong, right? Right here, we're talking about that there's a some kind of meditation, some kind of mindfulness of this idea. Now, such a fear, and what's the fear here? Of the presence, not of the repercussion of the presence. Not that, you know, God's going to be angry at me and now he's going to strike me down or he's going to do something bad to me. That's fear of punishment. We're not talking about fear of punishment at all. That is um, very elementary. That's a, more of a childlike form of fear. Here it's the fear of the presence. And if that presence isn't of God, is not felt palpably in the heart, or it's not even in a sense in your mind that you feel a, an awesomeness of that notion when you think about it, but it just helps you re to refrain because you thought of God's presence now, and hey, I, I, I do this often, I mean, not often enough, but I do it. I think, God, what do you want from me right now when I'm at a difficult crossroads or, you know, I'm in a relationship that something is maybe paining me and, and my, you know, my animal soul is kind of telling me something, you know, that would be wrong to do. <laughs> um, I think of that. That's called the fear of God. God, what do you need from me? What do you want from me now? What should I be doing? That bringing to mind of the presence 
is called the fear of heaven. It's the lower level. It's what should precede doing any good that we do. Because then that do that good that we do has uh, intent, has kavana, has mindfulness, rather than doing something, you know, mechanically or on autopilot, out of rote. There's a higher level of fear, and it's called actually um, yiras boishis, a shame-faced fear, and and that um, I know the word shame is not a PC word in Western civilization today, and and I get that, um, but uh, here it means not in the negative form, not shame that I'm worthless, no shame that when I feel the presence of the greatness of God. So, for example, um, you know, I've had the privilege to be many times before the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and when anybody has been ever before greatness, you feel small. Not because that person made you feel small. Great people don't make you feel small. But when you understand and are aware of their greatness, you're going to feel smallness of yourself before their greatness right again not because they made you feel that way because that that would not be appropriate that's not great people (laughs) but you understand how great they are and therefore that's how you feel in front of them that's shame-faced fear which is a very healthy thing um a very healthy thing so before god there is that higher level which we're going to get into that more in the following chapter um which that comes after doing good this is the fear that we're talking about over here of the presence of god again even just that you think it even though that you don't feel it or intellectually are moved by it but the very fact that you are thinking it that is a fear that should be before doing any mitzvah any kind of good that you do now if you don't have this before doing good, before doing a mitzvah, then the mitzvah you, you do will, and the good that you do, will be coming out of doing it uh, mechanically, rote. Now, mechanical over here, you know, you might say, well, uh, you know, I gave charity with a full heart because I, I felt, you know, this person who was down and out and I was compassionate for their needs and I gave to them and therefore that was mindful. That's true. Absolutely. But it's not mindful about your divine connection. We're not talking here about limiting yourself to the human condition. You know, <laughs> to see someone who's down and out and to be callous towards it is, you know, that's like totally off the charts. But to be empathetic or caring or sympathetic um, and, and to care for an, another is, that's human. Of course, that needs to be. Um, but that's, that's simpler because the person's right before you and they're present and you sense and you can, you know, you can feel God and your relationship with God, which is the first relationship, which then all other relationships, when they are, um, formed and based in, um, and similar to that relationship that we have with God. That's what we're talking about here, and that's a much healthier way. That is um, much more difficult, as as the Altered is now explaining to us how difficult that might be, and yet that's okay. The very fact that we're earnest about that connection. Um, so if a person doesn't have this level of fear, this mindfulness that we're talking about over here, then the mitzvah that you do is missing a wing. And it doesn't ascend because it's only two wings that a bird has that uh, it makes it fly. If you want your mitzvah to fly, meaning that it's going to fly to the divine, be eternal, be ultimately experienced, as we've explained in the past, times of Mashiach, and when our soul leaves this world. But if you're lacking that, and you only do it out of love, let's say. Let's say you do it out of love. Oh, hey, all you need is love. Well, that's for all. No, you need fear too. And as in human relationships, we understand that, that, you know, if I really love somebody, then I need to fear 
slash respect. Respect is fear. And as we explained yesterday, respect comes before even love in human relationships and in our relationship with God. You have to have first make space for another, and then you can embrace them with love. And that's why this is the first thing. Make space for God, meaning make space that he is, that there's some realness, at least, you know, mental awareness of it, thinking it. Um, and then when we have the two, the two together, then we the mitzvah will fly. Now you might say, well, if this idea of the presence of God is so powerful that even, you know, if I'm just mindful of it, um, meaning I don't have a palpable feeling and I don't even have the intellectual fear, right, of being sort of awed by it intellectually, then it moves me. But uh, it it does, it's there, and because of that thought, you know, I'm, I refrain from some negative behavior. So why do I need love? So Altair says, no, you need love too. You have to awaken at least a natural love that you have. Um, and, and because you need the two wings, you need the two wings, love and fear, in order that the good that we do isn't, mechanical isn't just a human love but it's divine it's a divine connection and that's what we're doing today now let's let's bring that to here so what's the intent we're we're learning torah right now right so right now we should be or like before we learn or at some point during the learning that our divine soul as well as our vivifying soul slash animal soul together with the garments of self-expression of thought, speech, and action. So the thought, speech, and action of my divine soul, the thought, speech, and action of my even animal soul, right? Which is, hey, and and part of my, and, and the body that's in, involved in that, my speech, that it should cleave to God. That's what I want. I want that I should be cleaved, I should be connected to God through this, what I'm doing right now. So, in summary, what do we have? We need to embrace both the love, which is like symbolic of a child to a love, a love of a parent, and then that of a servant who serves the master, the king, serves out of fear, respect, and awe. Different levels of that. Um, we need both things in order to uh, have our good deeds, our mitzvahs, soar on high, that they become a divine connection rather than just a human engagement or mechanical, doing it out of rote. Ooh, powerful stuff. So, um, or a quick reminder that anybody on Facebook has a question, please put two question marks first so I can notice that it is indeed a question. Okay, I've got, let me look over here. You know, I want to hear from Club Clubhouse, please. I want to hear from you guys to share with your questions and thoughts. But before, let me just get to Claudia. Would people be more inclined to do what they are supposed to do if they were taught to respect God and ultimately themselves instead of fearing? So, uh, again, I'm, I don't know what you mean, Claudia, by the word here, fearing. If fear is fear of punishment, I, I agree with you, right? That's not what we should be teaching, fear of punishment, even though there is that level. And by the way, um, if the only thing that will stop you from doing wrong is the fear of punishment, well, that's better than doing wrong, right? So if if you are fearing the the wrath of your spouse because you're going to say something nasty well that's better <laughs> that's better that you should feel you know do it uh, and, and refrain from saying something nasty than um do, saying it obviously now that's a child's level though right what do we need to do is come to uh, um, a much more uh, mature level and that is I don't want to disconnect from my spouse. I don't want to disconnect from God. 
So that's what we're talking about here is the presence is of, of God and what do you need from me? What do you want from me? Um, brings me to not to disconnect and to be aware um, of what I should do, hopefully. So, um, so that's, you know, and so the respect of God is, in this sense, uh, the presence of. Okay, one more question. I struggle to understand the notion that God wants us, needs us, and to act in that way and to have kavana to do or not to do. Um, oops, I got lost that. Isn't he ain't safe and in, in, independent of his creation, this realm? How can we understand that God needs us, humans, love, wants, needs, human emotions? How can we understand it? Oh, the circle of life. What an excellent, excellent question. God loves us. <laughs> uh, God needs us. That's a, an amazing question. So let me ask you a question. Um, God gives us commandments. He tells us, you know, this is the life that a Jew should lead, 613 commandments, and for non-Jews, seven Noahide the uh, universal laws, right? And, uh, and I, you know, this is what I... So I could look at it, as many people do, as, you know, as, as I bought my, uh, um, my um, uh, dishwasher for, I think, I don't know, for the second time in recent years for whatever reason because I guess we didn't follow the instructions the first time so we ruined it we sinned <laughs> right so this time we followed the instructions right and the person who gave us the instructions doesn't care whether we um, follow don't follow they give us the instructions right but I guess that's good for you I'm giving it to you so you should follow the instructions on how to put your dishwasher together right so if God is giving us instructions how to lead our lives, but I couldn't care less. Well, what kind of God is that? We call him our father, right? He's, he's a, like a parent. So a parent that would say to a child, you know, I'm going to give you instructions on life on how to have a good life. Because, you know, I went through the, 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 the school of hard knocks. And I know well, uh, you know, of all the challenges. And I just want to tell you, but you know what? what whether you succeed or, or do well or whether you, you know, follow it or don't follow I couldn't care less. Yeah, what kind of parent would that be? Pretty vile. Well, how could that be God couldn't care about what we do? Ah, you're going to ask, but he's infinite. He's beyond that. You know what that means? He infinitely cares. Not that he doesn't care because he's infinite. He infinitely cares. Me? How much do I care? I, I care. Somewhat. I'm human. So I'm not infinite. So I care. Like, do I? How much do I care that you do a mitzvah? I care. Do I care like God cares? He cares infinitely. Now, if I follow his way, then I'll care more beyond the human condition, you know, more infinitely, so to speak, right? As much as, or beyond, transcendent at least. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. But God cares infinitely. He loves infinitely. It matters to him infinitely. That's his inner desire, what he wants, what he truly wants. Now, where we have to make a distinction is God as creator. That is a means to an end. That's not what he truly cares. But me being good, me doing good, me doing a mitzvah to be bound up and connected to him, infinitely cares, infinitely wants that. And if he wants it, in a sense, there's a need. In a sense, you could call it a need. But the difference is my needs are human needs that I um, can't control, so to speak, right? We have biological needs that we can't all, you know, uh, when you have to use the facilities, you know, at some point you got to use it, right? <laughs> if you got to, at some point you got to eat, at some point you got to sleep. So God doesn't have those, um, those needs or those limitations, but he imposed upon himself 
a limitation. And what is that limitation? Uh, not a limitation. He imposed upon himself that what we do affects him. It is a divine pleasure. It's a, a divine uh, fragrance and pleasure above than when we fulfill his will. Marcy, I think you wanted to ask something or to share with us. So I have an I know now. Um, uh, Hakesh Barthu is like uh, Lahabdil, a ham radio operator who listens on every frequency at once. So wherever you find your point of connection, even if it's not the same point today as it is tomorrow, Hashem is listening on all frequencies. And I'm done. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, anybody else who want to share with us on Vilma? Hi, Rabbi. So I know now because I've seen and listened and experienced that connecting to God, whether it's in private or in public, davening or whatnot, putting aside our human needs and getting into that space and realm of, you know, peace and loving kindness, connection, respect for God is really important. It's really important in order to really attune and be focused on just God and serving him in that regard, whether it's prayer or a mitzvah, whatever it is we're doing, there needs to be that focused time and attention, which means putting aside our needs for doing other things and thinking other thoughts. And that's really hard. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So, um, yeah, just to add to that, that uh, for sure we want to get into the space, to the zone. I know when I dive in, you know, I, I try to do that. It, it's not always so easy because, you know, um, our minds might be preoccupied with other things and, and it's hard to. So the earnest uh, attempt of, you know, having that awareness and wanting to connect, as we, as we just mentioned about learning Torah here, that you know, through this learning that we are uh, truly connecting and cleaving, literally cleaving to God is like, wow, a very powerful idea that um, we, um, even if we're not get into the zone and to experience it on some level, the fact that we think that, that is a complete service. That is, you know, having a wing of you know uh, presence of god that will allow the mitzvah to fly Batya. well actually it's gonna be i'm i'm making <laughs> ah david okay yes so um you know i see that when uh when we're not we don't have people around us and where we like you said we we do our own thing and then some pops in the room we want to straighten out or or um even just just having an awareness oh hashem is watching us at this moment we will start straightening out and start maybe correcting oh maybe i didn't realize i'm doing the wrong thing or doing something that's a little bit off or not not 100 percent uh what he would want from from me you know so right i mean yeah we need to uh keep that keep it present i, I mean we, i think we have to remind ourselves or even by learning but you know we need, we need to uh... it, it, it's not so difficult to just stop and take a breath and 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 and, and just think uh, what, a, what 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 i think the healthy thought is um what god what do you need from me right now mm -hmm. um and and when you do that then that's giving you his presence not just his presence what he needs from you right now and you know um i'm uh, sometimes sometimes by the way you're doing two good things but there's the right thing right that you should be doing at that moment and and sometimes just think okay what do you need from me now that gives you the focus of that you can put yourself aside and put you know uh what god needs of me now in the forefront and allow me then to choose the right thing that's the uh definitely a very healthy and good thing that we can do 
let me go back let me go over here to susan how does one impart these concepts to adult relatives otherwise we are being taken advantage of susan i'm not exactly clear what you mean how do we um um what do you mean that we're going to be taken advantage of why would we be taken advantage of if you're doing what's right irrespective of them and that's important right is not about the consequence that you want to achieve that's not right that's pragmatic that's self um self-fulfilling you know what am i going to achieve from this now so i mean you got to sometimes feel what you're going to achieve in order you know to know what the right path is uh, that's true but i'm not clear susan if you can if you can uh, give me more clarity um i kind of sense that what she's saying is that she's trying to help other people get to a certain space but like we can't do things for other people. We can model behavior. We can, you know, show people, you know, what by what we do and how we live. But we can't really control other people's outcomes and whatnot. Right. So you're trying to share with people, um, and you don't want to it's some something good, and you don't want to be taken advantage of. Um, okay. I don't know why that has to be a contradiction or why, you know, Susan, if you can uh, clarify, please. Um, Greg from Bakersfield, did not Hashem create us so he could love us? Maybe he did not need, but he wanted to. Uh, he didn't create us because he loves us. No. Because love then doesn't have to be expressed here that doesn't have to be he can love us in the spiritual realm we don't have to come into this world for him to love us um it's not because he needs love therefore he created us no god doesn't need love that that's get the beetles out of your head <laughs> it's a juke it's in your head <laughs> No, all you need is love. God, all he needs is love, and therefore he created me. No, that's not Jewish. That's so not Jewish. He didn't need love, and therefore he creates us. And we don't need love either. If you need love, go get a, go to your mother and ask her for a hug, if that's what you need, right? <laughs> it's a, a, a whole you know, a, 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 a misconception about relationships. We don't have a relationship so we can have love no and 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 we're not doing and we're not having a relationship here with god so we can have love then then it's that's and that's why and, and i'm going to emphasize this again sorry greg but being so strong over here but um that's why respect in a relationship which is a, the concept of fear by the way making space for another and not a right comes before love because if if love is what is the 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 goal then that's all about me you know in hebrew we say yesh misha ehed there is someone that loves i that love you i'm the lover you're the beloved and that's where there's so much abuse and objectifying another because i want to love you well and it's all about you where, where am I? Respect comes first. That makes space for the other. That there is another. That you respect their, not just their space, of course, but you respect their being. And when you can respect their being, that they are who they are, then, then you can love them for that. And then you can have a true and, and healthy relationship. But if God would create us because, you know, so he could love us that's very you know that's western that's not divine I, I hope that was clear so um he created us well we were souls before here but he brought us into this world because here there's two things we can create a 
divine abode for him here. And what's, why is that important? Because that way we can partner with him in creation. That he makes a physical world and we make the from a physical world. He takes from the spiritual makes a physical world. We take from the physical and bring it back to the spiritual. So that's, um, you know, And yes, it is out of a love uh, that he has for us, but, you know, absolutely, I guess it's the, the, the other way around. Love is about a bond, a connection. Uh, love is um, a desire to cleave to, well, whether it's to God or to another person. Okay, that's what love is. Uh, uh, did I answer everything over here? Was anybody else put up their hand over here? Yes, Anastasia put up her hand. Anastasia. Share with us. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Rabbi. I'm, I'm actually hailing from uh, Queen Mary Dufferin, so not far away from you. <laughs> wow. I know, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, Rabbi, I struggle with the idea that, that we, we mentioned that a mitzvah is resting on, on two wings, so to say. The love of Hashem and the fear of Hashem. That means that when either or two of the wings are missing, that would invalidate the mitzvah, and uh, if I understand if I understood that correctly, that doesn't really sit well with me because to me mitzvah is an accomplished act that has an effect on the world. For example, for giving charity, the fact of uh, us giving charity has happened. The act of us having kissed the mezuzah when we were enter a, a room or building has happened. Does it really invalidate or diminish the mitzvah? when an intent is not there. I'm Anastasia, I'm done speaking. Thank you, Anastasia. <clears throat> Excellent question. And um, I realize, and, and this is one of the challenges, of course, is that, you know, when we're in chapter 41, <laughs> and we went, and we dealt with this at length in chapters 35 through uh, 37, and, and we have reiterated it um, several times, but, it, as everything, we need to reiterate it uh, again and again. And you're absolutely correct in what you're saying. The mechanical act of a mitzvah, and I actually briefly mentioned it in, in, earlier in the class, but it was very brief and maybe it, you know, it didn't come across clearly enough. Um, in the actual act of doing a mitzvah, like putting up a mezuzah, giving charity, putting on tefillin, lighting Shabbat candles, that there is absolutely no intent. You did it mechanically. You bring a divine connection to you in this world and to um, the material that you've engaged in is uplifted and upgraded uh, from Klippas Noiga, from a, a mid-level of, you know, of materiality that could be used in a degrading way or a, an, an uplifting way. And whether you have an intent or not, you put up a mezuzah, you, uh, you said your prayers, now you have to have, you know, obviously, in the prayers, you have to be uh, minimally aware that you're you know, speaking to God. Um, or, you know, uh, studying Torah and the like. Absolutely, there is an essential bond with God that is to the essence of God that is created in that act. And that cannot be taken away. It has, an, it's an end in itself. And, and the proof is that, you know, in Chabad, we'll go out in the streets and we'll find a... We'll ask someone if they're Jewish, and you'll say, come, do the mitzvah of, uh, you know, it's the holiday of Suk uh, Sukkot now, Sukkot, come make a blessing on the Lula of an Esraig, and even though they have no intent, you know, they might be pleasing me to do it, you know. Um, I mean, they understand that it's a mitzvah, but they have no uh, mindfulness of, you know, connecting to God and so on and so forth. Did they do a mitzvah? Absolutely. Were they connected to God in that moment? Absolutely, no question. And as we went through those three chapters at length, uh, explaining that not only that, the animal soul and the body is that's engaged in that mitzvah, that moment is bound up in that moment to God. Absolutely. 
What we're adding here, what the Alter Rebbe is adding here, is to bring it to the next level. The wings bring it, ascend, make it, the mitzvah ascend. When you do the mechanical act, God is descending, so to speak, into this material world, in the physicality of this world, the physicality of me, in the act of doing that mitzvah, there's a bond. But that doesn't make the mitzvah eternal. It's in that moment. It's in that moment you, you, you did it. How, what makes it eternal is that it needs to ascend, that it needs wings. What makes it that it will be there um, and that... Uh, for uh, to the divine attributes above that is connected with the divine above that therefore will be ultimately illuminating us in the time to come of Mashiach and, and beyond um, that needs wings that needs intent, kavana and Anastasia, was is that clarify the issue? Yes, uh, Rabbi I'm clapping, thank you very much <laughs> God bless you <laughs> God bless you. Anybody else have, uh, let me see, any other questions here? Clem, I know, oh, that was in my alert. Okay. Um, just seeing if we have any other questions. Anybody here on Clubhouse that would like to add to the conversation? Please, don't be bashful. One thing, Rabbi, if I can say about love Mm -hmm. is that you're so right. Love isn't about us. It's not like a selfish thing. You know, like you said, I love you is all about the person and them feeling good about the love itself, but it's not really about the love that they give to the other. Because the ultimate expression of love is loving another in the way they want to be loved. So God has a specific purpose for us being here and a specific way he wants us to show love you know, via commandments and Torah and right. mitzvahs and stuff like that. So there's a whole purpose of it, and it doesn't mean that it's all about us. It's not a selfish love that I want to feel good, and right. therefore I want you as a trophy or a merit or whatever it is, right? Right. Or, 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 or I, I, you know, I love the way you make me feel, right? You make me feel a million dollars. You make me feel valuable. You make me feel great. So I love right. you. Right, that is a problem, right? Why is that a problem? Because before that has to come respect. Before the love, because if you will have the respect, then you make the space for the other, and therefore you appreciate the other for them being another, not being connected to me, so to speak, or, you know, whatever. And then, as you said, Vilma, exactly as you said, then the love will be a healthy love, then the, then the love will be, um, can express in what you need, right? And you can do that lovingly because you had that respect first. Very, very good. Thank you for sharing that. Very important point. All right. Anybody else here? Um, I don't see any other questions on. Did I miss the, the Vida? Did I miss anybody on Facebook with a question? Liba is having her first vaccine today. Can we say a bracha for Liba? She's having her for... Okay, you should be healthy and it shouldn't be any problem. Um, You should be... uh, Yeah, it should be 100% only good. Uh, Eugenia actually is asking, but when Hashem is descending due to the mitzvah without intention, does it have any lasting effect? It's in the act of doing the mitzvah that at that moment you're bound up with God. But the next moment, you know, you're not doing a mitzvah. So you're not bound up with God in the next moment. You're doing something else. So in the act, there is the bound, being bound up in that act at the moment. The physical material object that I'm using is also elevated through that. Um, and um, so it's not, it's not lasting. It's in that moment. It, I mean, I should say it's not lasting. There is some kind of lasting effect, but it doesn't have the wings to fly in the sense that it will be then um, part of the experience that I haven't gotten in. Now, that being said, by the way, I want to say that when you put on tefillin with someone on the street, it might be the opposite. It might be that they're really doing it from, and they're just not mindful of it uh, totally, but from a real, you know, that the soul 
is yearning to connect and they're just not aware of it again because as we mentioned the soul cut might come from a lower grade uh and also we you know we might have done things to our soul that makes it insensitive to goodness and to godliness to mitzvah so um it might not have that sensitivity of awareness but really what's motivating this person is the inherent love and uh and awe that the soul has the inherent desire that the soul wants to be attached to god wants to be uh, not disconnected from its creator and that is um definitely uh something that happens okay all right folks this is amazing you guys are um great uh, i want to th- oh marjan sorry i didn't see please marjan share with us hello rabbi hello everyone Hi, um, rabbi i just wanted to say that an example of what you were uh, talking about for me is personally in davening for example i feel the connection much more strongly when i'm davening in persian which is my mother tongue right but on the other hand, I know that this connection with Hashem is, from what I've learned, is a stronger uh, when we daven in Hebrew because I read that the words themselves have power in Hebrew. I think it's an example of love. Do I want to show that love to Hashem the way that I feel more comfortable or the way that He prefers it? He prefers to be loved. Mm. Which is something that I'm still struggling with because davening goes much more smoothly for me when I'm davening in Persian because I understand uh, what exactly every word means at any given moment. In Hebrew, though, it's a struggle. Mm, excellent question. So um, I would suggest definitely you should daven in Persian um, for sure. But like you said, the Hebrew words are holy words from the holy tongue and they carry a weight that's beyond your intent and your feelings so try to introduce some hebrew little by little in understanding the hebrew at the same time so if you can understand the hebrew because you've done it in persian and now you're you know doing it in hebrew and you're trying to get some of the words uh you know and and just do it a paragraph at a time maybe in in hebrew that then um, you have the best of both um, that's what i would suggest but i i would not suggest that you don't dab in and pray in persian because that touches your heart that gets you you know the feeling of connection and and important because prayer is unique about the heart you know as opposed to torah studies of course is an intellectual understanding that hopefully will seep to the heart you know and affect our heart but it's about an intellectual in, in uh, you know understanding of the of the uh, divine wisdom but and and if you're doing a mitzvah of uh, lighting shabbat candles or another mitzvah light, you know benching making the blessing on the lug of an esrig on the holiday of sukkis those are um, not about the heart specifically right i mean we want to engage the heart but they're not specifically about the heart where prayer is specifically about the heart and therefore we want to make sure that our heart is engaged as best as possible so if you want to say it in english i mean i'm sorry in, in persian in your instance uh, or in english if it's someone else that wants to pray in english of course it's important that we verbalize the words and not just read them then yeah go for it you know persian thank that's you, the Rabbi. way thank you so much all right thank you for sharing Anybody else um, have something to share with us before we close up shop for today? Wow, this is a great conversation over here. Danielle has a question. Okay, where do I see? Oh, can a Ben Noach daven? So Ben Noach is uh, someone who's following the seven Noachide laws, um, and um, meaning someone who isn't Jewish who's following seven universal laws that is set out in the Torah, and asking if should they pray absolutely they should uh they should pray um what the format of that prayer should be that's a good question um definitely some of the you know psalms from king david are absolutely something that you can use and engage in and it would be uh val- valuable and uh, definitely uh, one should pray 
uh, you know, I don't know if there's a specific text to use besides, you know, King David's Psalms that I can think of, um, you know, the, the prayer book itself that we use. Um, I'm not certain if that is the necessary. I don't think that's necessary. I'd have to do more research on that. What would be the best thing to do? But I'll get back to you. Thank you for that. Okay. May I add something quickly? Sure, Marcy. Go ahead. Uh, just a comment on on praying in one's native language versus Hebrew. Um, one of the things I read um, is a biography of Nathaniel Bowditch, who was a mariner, a seafarer, and he rewrote the times tables. Doesn't tide tables? It really doesn't matter. Uh, he was a, a famous uh, intellectual. Uh, colonial American uh, seafarer, but he taught himself different languages using the Bible, starting with the English, and he would, and that's that's how he learned like seven languages. He got different translations of the Bible and used the Bible to learn all the other languages. And so, I, I really want to emphasize what what Rabbi said is that you know start start small, you know start with something that you know like the Shema. You know, where you you know all the words in Persian, and it's one or two sentences at a time, where you can just add those in slowly so that you feel them. Excellent. Thank you, Marcy. Very good. Thank you for adding that. Uh, Matt, please share with us. Good morning, um, Rabbi Ronnie. I'm so thankful for this topic. It's uh, it's kind of been on my mind a little bit lately, and I, I wanted to ask you a question because I, uh, for a while now, I've been in the Jewish communal professional space, mm -hmm. and um, I was in a synagogue. Now I'm in Israel education, but I'm about to switch to a new job where I'm going to be running a religious school at a um, synagogue. And my question is, as a professional, I often find that it's it's hard to turn off during the times of services and holidays because you are, you know, you're either running children <laughs> programs or all kinds of things. Um, and I've always admired, like, the Chabad rabbis and Rebbitsons who are doing a million things. They also, you know, they've taken time that I've seen to, you know, have that meaningful parts through the service. So I guess, sorry to ramble on a little bit, but I wanted to ask you, you know, what are your... What are your suggestions or thoughts on how to have uh, meaning and feel things in the service when you also are trying to run a million things as that's your uh, Matt, oh boy, you're talking to me. <laughs> as you as you said, there's, you know, the Chabad uh, rabbis and rabbitsons who, you know, um, have to run in their Chabad houses so many different things at the same time. And, 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 and hey, I'm also Jewish. I have to daven. I have to pray, you know, uh, I can't just run the uh, run for everybody else things. I also have uh, the responsibility of, of praying. And boy, is that a challenge. I got to tell you, there's no question, you know, with things running in your mind and what you got to do. But I have this in, in, in my morning as I'm coming to prepare for this, <laughs> for us learning together. I have this challenge because I'm thinking about, you know, different things of, yeah, how to, what to give over and, uh, you know, posting and this and that. Uh, and then on Shabbos, you know, you've got so many different things that you've got responsibility to take care of. So what I do, what I try to do, at least, is I stop myself and say, hey. And I say to myself, hey, I'm also Jewish. I also have to pray. Well, you just the congregants have to pray. Uh, I have to pray just as much as they do. Right? I have the responsibility, I have the obligation, I have the, uh, the, 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 I want to, I want to do this, right? So just stop what you're thinking, stop the, the, the rush that's going in your head of the, uh, this and that, and just focus now. You're saying whether it's the Shema, whether it's, you know, Baruch Shama, whatever it is that I am, I have to stop myself literally in my tracks and I tell myself, that I, I have this conversation with myself. Hey, God, need, God wants me to pray now. That's what he wants from me. This, this idea, and, and, and I mentioned it before, Matt, so I'm mentioning it again because you're right. In this instance, it's really, um, it, it's really where you've got, the, you know, two, you know, you've got the fork in the road and two ways to go. And both of them are good things. I got a daven. And I gotta take care of different things that I have responsibility. 
so at some point obviously when there is a responsibility you have to take care of the responsibility and and that because others are you know you have responsibility to others and that you know i can always daven if i'm not with the minion so i can you know i i can go at my own pace that's that's not so important what's if i take care of the other people's needs but then when i come back i say to myself okay now i did that i'm, I'm not at the fork in the road anymore I, I dealt with that part now even though my mind might be racing for the next thing i gotta no right now what god needs from me focus 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 daven you're standing before god he's hearing me and he wants me he wants my devotion right now that's what i say that's what i do and uh, matt thank you for bringing it up because boy is that something that um is a um daily struggle because you know right now teaching it's very easy for me to focus because you know, the intellectual engagement you know of the, of the mind so it's easy to focus the mind and it's not racing other places um but prayer because it's of the heart its nature is not of the mind it's of the heart and the heart has so many layers and it's so easy to have the heart you know the natural um, urges of the heart forget even if they're negative things uh, those things for sure but even if they're you know, neutral things or things that we have like like you said other obligations and duties that we have to do that uh, because of that the ways on my heart so therefore that's going to be the thoughts in my mind got to just stop ourselves and that's that's what i do i hope that helps you matt yeah the, the, i love that lots of lots of uh, mute clashing for me <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> that's what we got to do and um and it's uh it's amazing we're, we're we're able and capable of doing it that that's the amazing thing you know it's in our um in our um it's in our it, it's in our uh, capability it's in our reach um as Margot Lazetta says from Poland, focus, 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 and then just repeat it. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, oh, thank you, Liana. She shares it. It's a real gift to have to pray at Chabad Zich and Kedeshim. That's our place here. My davening has improved over the year. Beautiful. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, at least, you know, uh, at least I'm helping someone else. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping mine is also improving. <laughs> um okay am i missing the, the, the vida i think we're going to continue this conversation tomorrow because this is an important conversation i'm looking to see if i missed anybody daniel okay we got so i think we got everybody folks amazing i really want to thank you all um for making this a, an amazing uh, daily experience um vilma please close off Thank you very much, everyone who joined us on Facebook and Clubhouse. This is courtesy of the Chabad um, of Clubhouse. If you want to follow it, please um, go ahead on Clubhouse, click on the green house. If you want to follow Robbie Fine as well, I encourage you to. He does these specific talks every day, Monday through Friday at 9.30 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you all for joining.